Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this online worship service. This recording is a pre-recording of our worship services that we hold in both of our locations, both in Asheville and in Hendersonville. We have three services, two services in Asheville, 8 a.m. and 10:15 a.m. with family Bible time in between for all ages, and then also a 9:30 a.m. service in Hendersonville, followed by family Bible time for all ages. This pre-recorded service is an abbreviated version of what we offer in those three services on Sunday, and we would love for you to join us as we grow in God's Word together. Today is another Sunday in this series entitled Untethered, where God who is boundless has chosen to bind the power of the Spirit to his Word, and so we get to see how that works as Jesus' ministry continues to take shape. We'll be looking at Jesus' ministry throughout the course of this summer, as we typically do. Today we get to see how Jesus could have taken a man who was freed from demon possession, many demons in fact, and he could have used him in ministry, but instead he caused the spread of his kingdom to work in a stationary way by keeping that man in his region so that he might reach his fellow townspeople and countrymen and that would have a great impact in the months and years and eternity to come. May God bless our worship in his name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God invites us to come into his presence. And as we do, it is important, as always, to remember where we stand before God, our orientation underneath him and his commands. Even so, we should humbly and penitentially confess our sins to him. Let us do so now quietly. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to live perfectly in our place, to die on the cross, to remove our sin, and to rise from the grave, to prove that we are at peace with God, that our sins are forgiven, and that we have eternal life with him now and forever. Therefore, in Christ's name, I get to say to you what God says to you. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Continue to send your messengers to preserve your people in true peace that by the preaching of your word, your church may be kept free from all harm and danger. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The gospel for today from Luke chapter 8 will also serve as the basis for the sermon. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into sol solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. 
Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So we got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can tell a lot about a person when that person comes face to face with a very awkward and maybe even disgusting and ugly scene. I think of a place I used to work. I had a boss who did not like personal injuries. And there was one time when a person's arm got cut open and it was quite deep and wide open, you could even say. Even describing it that, although very generally, not specifically, that can cause some of you to get quite squeamish. For me and for a few other people, we weren't necessarily bothered by that. And one of the other workers jumped right in, was ready to, to try and do some makeshift stitching, but there were no utensils around or a needle and thread or anything like that, so especially a clean needle and string, preferably, so suture, that is. So instead he went and found some butterfly bandages, and he was right there squeezing the flesh together and butterflying it together and then taping it to hold it all in until that person could go see the doctor. And the doctor later commented that that was really well done for an amateur. You can see that maybe when a child gets sick and that sickness is displayed all over the floor. There are some people who just can't handle puke. And so when it comes to puke, people go running away, but then there are some people who are unfazed. I can think of many a parent that I've seen who are not phased by that at all. They'll help the child, maybe make sure nobody gets into the, the mess accidentally, take care of the child to get them cleaned up and clean up the mess, wash your hands, say a prayer that you don't catch whatever they have, and just be done with it. You could tell a lot about a person. Do they run in? Do they walk in? Are they a little squeamish and afraid? Do they hate the awkward and the ugly? So what does it tell you about our Savior? He knew exactly where he was going. Jesus' home base was on the west side of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, and now they're going to the other side, the east side of the Sea of Galilee, this lake. And as he gets over there, this region of the Gerasenes, he comes into contact with this demon-possessed man. This is not a big place. I wonder if the reputation of this man had spread around. It's not like there's a million people around and he's but a drop in the bucket. This would have been small. It wouldn't have been too overpopulated. Quite possibly, Jesus knew what he was getting into. In fact, in in inevitably, he did. And yet, look at him. He knows where he's going. He knows who he is about to see. He knows what he's getting into, and so do these demons. These demons cry out to the man, and before we go any further, it's probably important to ask ourselves, wait a second, are we talking about demon possession like this is actually a real thing? Almost every single time we get to talk about Satan, the devil, demons, uh, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, we almost always, in fact, pretty much every single time we will get into this type of, of discussion. Are we really talking about this? Is this real? Maybe it's important for us to consider for a moment how real demon possession is because demons are real. And, and before you dismiss or just cut this video off, just, just consider these two points. First of all, however old you are, if you cut your life in half right now and think of where you were half of your lifetime ago, consider how much evil you knew at that point in your life. Did you think that there was as much evil as you know now? I would probably assume correctly that you have become more and more aware that this world is filled with all sorts of evil beyond what you ever could have imagined half of your lifetime ago. Well, consider the logical progression then. If half of your lifetime ago you could not have even imagined how evil the world is, 
and now you see how evil it is, well, let's say by the end of your life, do you think you will experience even more and, and understand even better how wicked this world is and how there's really evil, deep, dark evil in the world? Well, then who's to say that that logical progression doesn't get exponentially worse and therefore is the deepest, darkest, worst, and most horrible kind of evil? Is it then not reasonable that that exists? If the older we get, we only realize how deeper and darker the evil in this world is, then maybe it is not so unreasonable to not only say, but to believe that, yes, there is this deep, dark evil called the devil and demons. Secondly, whenever people hear about demons and demon possession, sometimes they think that, well, this, this can't ever be. However, as believers, we take everything that God says in his word as true and look no farther than the first promise that God had made in the, in the Garden of Eden. He's speaking right to the serpent and he makes the first promise about the Savior that he would crush the serpent's head and yet the serpent would still strike Jesus' heel. When you look at the cross and the empty tomb, there is overwhel overwhelming evidence that those things most certainly happen. And nobody, especially Christians, don't discount those things. Well, if those great works of God's plan of salvation carried out in the person and work of Jesus Christ are the highlight, the hallmark, the precipice of everything that God said he was going to accomplish in Jesus Christ, well then, if God also said that it was through those very works that he was going to crush Satan, Satan's head, the devil, the chief demon, well then, to deny demons means we have to also be ready to deny just about anything that God says in his word, including the things that obviously we need the most. So maybe just with those two thoughts, we can and maybe should, certainly should, move forward acknowledging that this is absolutely real. That demons are most certainly out there. The devil is most certainly not only existing, but present in this world and even around our lives to do what? Well, to wreak havoc. And some might say, well, we don't see this today, but maybe they haven't talked to missionaries in distant lands who actually do see this. Maybe they haven't talked to pastors like I've talked to who have experienced circumstances that lead them to only say it had to be a demon and they are terrified about the experience that they had. Just because we haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not true. And maybe one other thing that's really important. If you were to look at the devil's playbook and you were to start flipping through the pages of his offensive against the church, Christians. Don't you think it would make a lot of sense for the devil if instead of showing how awful he is and revealing the ugliness, the nastiness, the disgusting works that he's doing, then instead maybe it would make a lot more sense to hide behind this idea that maybe he's not real. It's kind of like having a robber, a burglar, who's casing your house. Does he want you to know that he's coming by maybe tomorrow night? No. He wants you to think that you're safe and that there's absolutely nothing that's going to happen at all. So it is with every kind of evil. They don't want you to know. Why would it be any different for the devil? But is that not exactly one of the main problems that we see? It would be much easier if we just ignored evil altogether. If we just pretended like our lives were okay on our own. But you know what Jesus sees? Although it seems like that's comfortable, such complacency that is, Jesus knows that that is the true pit of ugliness. He's not just talking about how comfortable that might look as it runs corollary with the lives of people in our world today. No, he's looking at the soul. He sees the condition of somebody who is so spiritually naive and he has decided to unveil words just like these, accounts just like this, so that we would have to come face to face with the disgusting, the awful, only for our good. So this man, 
incidentally. He does not pull any punches as far as what he wants Jesus to do for him. Jesus walks over to this man, and this, this man possessed by a demon, he had been hurt many times, as you just heard in the, in the words that I just read. And these demons are begging they are begging not to go back to the abyss. What does that tell you? If even the demons themselves are saying, we don't want to go back home. It's kind of like if there was a little kid. Like I imagine maybe a, a little child in our preschool. Let's say that child came every day and right when the child was getting ready to go home, they were crying and crying and crying and screaming to their teachers, don't let me go home. Don't let me go home. Do you think we would be concerned about the home life after a while? So too, it would say something about the home life. So too, it says something about the abyss. If even these demons are saying, don't send us home. Anything, anything else. Look at those pigs, don't, don't send us home. So Jesus does just that. Jesus walks right in and he knows exactly what to do with the deepest, darkest evil in this world. No matter what you face, no matter what you've gone through, no matter how evil it has been, that circumstance you've experienced in your life, Jesus does not get squeamish. Jesus does not get awkward, and he certainly is not afraid to walk right up and to deal with it. This is the one who describes himself as Emmanuel, God with us. Why would he leave us when we need him the most? Why would he leave us in the sickness of our sin? Why would he leave us in the naivete of our spirit? Why would he leave us when, when we are covered by the devil's lies, who is masquerading around as everything that is good, when Jesus knows that he is full of lies and full of all that is wrong, Jesus walks right in to that scenario in order to free us, in order to help us. Look no farther than what you see in this account. Jesus casts those demons out of that man and he frees that man from that imprisonment. That's, that's what we heard, right? He sets that man free from every type of darkness, every type of of fear, every type of evil, every type of awful slavery. And Jesus does the exact same for me and for you. You, you may have heard the, the phrase or the quote that Mr. Rogers would share. Mr. Rogers, that it became quite popular, not only as I was growing up, but it, be, it became popularized in the movie in the last the, several years ago. But he shared this quote that he heard from his mom when he was talking about a terrible, tragic, emergency-type situation. That she would tell him to look at all of the emergency workers who go rushing in. You see the ambulances and the policemen, the firefighters, other, other bystanders who aren't going to sit there and watch. It makes you think of people like the Coast Guard, no matter where they are, whether it's the Aleutian Islands in Alaska or the far northeast corner of our country, where the tides are terrible and the waves are awful, where people are so afraid, where few will glow. It makes you think about our armed forces. It makes you think about the blessings that we have in this country, a country that we maybe too quickly criticize, a country that we are actually forced to, to thank God for, on this particular weekend. Look, look at all the heroes that go rushing in. And we can even see that in our own lives. We can see the people who, when we've been at our worst, when we've been in our low points, when we've been quite ugly, they're not afraid. They don't get squeamish. And all of these are but microcosms of who Jesus is himself. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing and take on the, took on the very nature of a servant. The God of heaven took on the very nature of a slave in order to free us from our slavery, to serve us, although we don't even deserve to be servants of God. He's the one who is the eternal son of God, and yet he made himself the compilation of all God's enemies by taking our sin on the cross. You want to talk about the ugliness of a wound. You want to talk about the ugliness of puke. Worse than all of the, that put together, Jesus became completely disgusting to his father in heaven, so his father would turn his face away and completely condemn his son. And it was in that moment where Jesus was so willing 
to be the compilation of all that is disgusting, to go to the cross and to consume all of that wrath from God for our sake so that we never would experience it. And to prove that that payment was made, that all of that disgusting sin was taken care of and removed, every spot, every blemish erased, God raised his son from the dead not just setting him free of his own death, but setting us free from that demise of death, which would only lead us to the abyss, except that Jesus has given us eternal life in heaven. Jesus set that man free. Look at that hero, and look at what that enables us to experience, not only in the lives of the people around us, but who have helped us, but in our own lives too. You see, when Jesus set this man free, you could imagine what that did for that man. He wanted to serve Jesus, just like you and I do. Having been set free from our sins, we can't pay Jesus back. We can't earn eternal life. But you know what we, we can do? We could do the exact same thing that Jesus enabled this man to do. All of the people come out, and this is very awkward. The pigs, their livelihood maybe, gone. These people, though, they don't embrace Jesus. They know who this man is, and he's in his right mind, sitting at Jesus' feet. They think he is the source of even more ugliness. It's now a detriment to their own lives. They could have contained it earlier by trying to keep this man chained and guarded and keep him at bay, but now they have to deal with this other kind of loss, deal with the reality of ugliness in their own lives. And Jesus could have done a lot of things here. Jesus could have brought all their pigs back and he could have extracted the demons and he could have pulled back the curtain to allow these people to see what these demons actually look like, which would have petrified these people on the spot. He could have done something like that. But you know what he did? God who is boundless, the son of God boundless, decided to make his kingdom work in this way. To make his words powerful And to not paint them on the sky or to use fantastic works, so to speak, like the ones I described. But to put them in our hands, those words that is, to put them in our mouths. This man, he wants to follow Jesus. These people, they're only afraid of Jesus. So what does Jesus do? He could have done so many things. If we were writing the plot line, we probably would have done differently. But Jesus does this. He tells the man to go back. And to share with these people what God has done for him. To proclaim the kingdom of God among these people. To take what was his own mess, washed free, washed away on account of Jesus. To watch, to to go back and to witness about the slavery from which he had been set free. To go back in and to help these people who, although they might look clean on the outside, they are caught in an ugly, nasty, despicable, disgusting mess on the inside to go back to them. And you know what happened? There's another account that we get to learn about a little bit later in the ministry of Jesus, the public ministry of Jesus. Jesus comes back a bit later. And you know what happens? All of these people come out to him. They pursue Jesus. They seek him out and they ask him to heal them. And for days, Jesus does just that. No longer afraid of him, they bring their disgusting, ugly, awful, wretched lives to Jesus. So that he, the only one who sets us free from every type of slavery now and forever, would give them the thing that they need the most. Not just freedom from sickness, not just an answer in the form of his light, to the darkness that they were facing in life. But he would give them forgiveness, pardon, and peace. Entrance into a kingdom that will never be taken away. A kingdom that is still taking those who are lost in darkness and bringing them into God's marvelous light. A kingdom that is still advancing against the gates of hell, rescuing souls that will be lost to the abyss and bringing them into his family so that God, through the power of his word, would rescue one soul after the other. 
And so here you are, standing, stationary, right where you are, right now. You might think that God has called you to go and to reach people in a far distant land. And maybe that would become more clear over time, who knows. But might it be that there are people right in your life, here and now. And God has said, look where you are, your station in life, the people at your work, the people in your home, the people in your family, the people in your neighborhood, the people in your community. So many of them might look like they don't have a lot that's going wrong. In social media, we have all of the nice things, that the nice profile pictures and makes everything look nice, like the family's always smiling and loving and hugging each other, right? So often people can make their own lives look that way too. But this account leads us to understand two things. There is deep, dark evil in this world, and it is out to ruin hearts and lives. And make no mistake, we know that it's going on in the world around us. And yet look at where we now stand, poised with the power of God's word, motivated by his grace to serve, and unafraid because God's word is the only thing that causes demons to go into pigs. It is the one thing that ultimately has even already crushed the serpent's head. And God has given this to you, to face not only the world, but the people right where you stand, no matter how ugly, no matter how disgusting, no matter how awkward. You have the beautiful, cleansing, freeing, life-saving word of your Savior. God grant you the zeal to use it. Amen. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this online service. If we could be of any encouragement to you and grow with you in God's word in any way, we would love to be able to do so. Simply check out our website or reach out to us through the contact information in our website. It is lsavior.org. God bless you this day, this week, and always. Take care.